people. Let's pray. Our Father God, we're so, so thankful for the Word of God, for the clarity that's there for our lives, for the hope that's presented there because of Jesus, and this precious gospel that we have to lean upon, that we can sing it as well with my soul. We pray as we share today from this that it might be that which uh, enlightens our hearts, our minds, our spirits to your great, great truth that you have in your word. Help us to be attentive and we pray this in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. It was April. Now it's the end of June. And our lives have changed. Quickly. Quickly. COVID-19, a virus science doesn't fully understand, has caused a disruption, not just here, but all over the world. Now on top of that, we have the social unrest that's been painful. Markets have crashed and gone back and forth. Rather than coming together, as we have in years past in the midst of difficulties and times of trouble, we're compelled to isolate, stay at home, stay at home. Workplaces, large and small, schools and colleges send employees home, students home with orders to telecommute. Many have gone without paychecks, Flights are grounded, ocean liners docked, sports suspended, sanctuaries emptied and quiet, ministers streaming live via social media, supermarket with their shelves, as we heard, not uh, finding what we want, face masks, kind of a lightning rod. For us, face masks are not a political statement. They're an expression of kindness. Outside, we're okay, I think. But inside, they're an expression of kindness for others, for their families, for their little ones. How do believers respond to the things that are happening around us? I think believers need to respond, as my dad would say, with faith and with wisdom. Faith and wisdom. In my mother's immortal words, this too shall pass. Today I'd like to address some of the questions, the common questions that people have. And first, I must say I'm thankful for this country. Crisis often reveals what we're made of, who we are. And I'm thankful for the first responders For the law enforcement, we have those in our congregation that are caught in the midst of social unrest. I'm thankful for the medical personnel, our amazing doctors, nurses, paramedics, who volunteered, many without being asked. Many represented in our congregation. I'm thankful for churches and for Christians who are praying and asking for God to bring wisdom in all of this. For me, yeah, I'm like you, I get tired. We we move differently in this. We have to think about things differently, change what we do, how we act, and we get weary, we get tired, we get drained. Probably like you, I struggle with things that I see and hear that are hurtful, and yet we still have to live life. We still have to live life. The rest of our lives are not put on hold. We still have day-to-day things that we're dealing with that have always been there. Family difficulties. The struggles of life are still there. Pressures. And they pile up in our lives. And it can cause us to be depressed and move into a feeling of hopelessness. 
And my prayer has always been, Lord, give me strength. Give me wisdom. Guide my thoughts. That they're your thoughts. That's probably your prayer. It's probably your prayer. I'm not a politician. I'm a preacher. That's my lane. That's where I stay. That's where I stay. I believe in the depths of my being that the gospel is the hope of the world. Amen. And I need to address two very frustrating and troubling questions that many people are asking. And the questions are why and how do we respond? How do we respond? This suddenly feels like a very unsafe world. And the truth is, it is an unsafe world. It is an unsafe world. And the biblical answer to why is that we live in a broken, we live in a fallen and a sinful world. Evil exists. And it shows up in a thousand ways. Some dramatic, some terrible, some unnervingly personal in our lives, with family, internal things that we struggle with. They're not all out there. There's a lot in here. There's a lot in here. And forgive me for being blunt, but we shouldn't be shocked. We reap what we sow. We weep what we sow. And that's true of people, that's true of nations. The world is increasingly dangerous. We, we've seen this over the last years. Extremists chasing Christians from their homes. Publishing videos. Gruesome things that are happening. Churches destroyed and they're being destroyed today. In nations of this world. The Western world has banished God from public discourse. And truthfully, our culture is perfectly designed to achieve the results we're experiencing. If we want different results, we need to change culture. We can't tell God to take a hike and then blame him for the mess. We'd love a world with no virus. No violence, no murder, no theft, no lying. A world in which people love and respect one another, accept differences, walk hand in hand with God. All, or maybe I should say most people desire a stable, peaceful environment. In 1963 in Chicago, when I was growing up, it was the height of the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King was shaking the nation. At the same time was this, the, the war in Vietnam that we spoke of a few Sundays ago. In 63, John Kennedy was assassinated. In 67 were the riots in Detroit. In 68, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. In 68, we had the Democratic Convention. There was unrest everywhere. Everywhere. And the nation was struggling. King's notion of nonviolence had six key principles. We talked about these on Wednesday night. And the first of those, all biblical, all biblical, we can resist evil without resorting to violence. And that filtered down through all of the principles. A message much needed today. The Civil War had officially abolished slavery, but it did not end discrimination. It continued with devastating effects on our nation in horrific ways. 
to marginalize black people, keep them separate from white people. Jim Crow laws were established in the South. At the end of the 19th century, black people couldn't use the same public facilities as white people, live in the same towns as white people, go to the same schools as white people, and most black people were not allowed to vote. And Jim Crow laws weren't adopted in the North, but blacks still experienced discrimination at their jobs when they tried to buy a house that I'm painfully aware of get an education. In 63, in 1963, I watched on a black and white TV, I was a teenager, as Dr. King gave that now famous speech, I have a dream. I have a dream. It was on the mall in DC. And the words still wreck me when I think of them. Listen, 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 and think of your own families. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands and hands with white boys and girls and sisters and brothers. I have two little grandchildren, black grandchildren. Moape, the oh my, our son's wife came from Zambia. Beautiful woman. There's not a mom or a dad here that doesn't have legitimate concerns for their children and their families. The Fair Housing Act became law on April 11th in 1968. Days after King was assassinated, it prevented housing discrimination based on race, sex, national origin, or religion. It was also the last legislation enacted during the Civil Rights Movement. I can tell you a lot about this. We were in the midst of it. I grew up in an all-white suburbs of Chicago. I had 4,400 kids, second largest high school in the state of Illinois, all white. The hatred oozed. That housing act, my dad got involved and eventually it led our family to move, which is why I'm here in Michigan. And we left the area because my dad got on a commission that was to help integration in our community. He came to church one Sunday and the deacon said, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to go. Packed up the car, took all of our stuff, six kids, and we moved to Michigan just in time for the 68 riots in Detroit. <laughs> the end of King's speech comes from Isaiah chapter 40. I have a dream that one day every valley will be exalted. That which is low will be brought up. Every hill, every mountain will be brought down, those who were so high and mighty before God. The rough places will be made plain, the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of God, the glory of God, of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. Powerful words. It's hard to disagree with someone quoting scripture at you. So here we are, 2020. Modern man, modern woman, we've come far. We've come far. Transplanting human organs, medical science, unbelievable. 
what we're able to do. Voyager to the immensities of outer space. Inventor of instantaneous communication from pole to pole. We all got our little machines. Architects of our own destiny, master of our own fate, captain of our own soul, Invictus. And what pride we have in ourselves. What pride we have in ourselves. We don't need supernatural help. We got this. We got this. We're our own gods. We can find the right answers in our own wisdom and implement those things and execute those right answers. And, and listen to me. Today, our culture tolerates, listen, tolerates religion. But there is no life and death desperate need for Jesus. Even in our churches, he's an add-on to our life. Value added. Value added. As Americans, we have faith in ourselves. We have faith in ourselves. We're enlightened. We got science. We're woke. We're like the Romans that Paul is referring to here in our text. Rome had everything except God as revealed in Jesus Christ. Even today, when we look at the, the ruins of Rome and people travel over there, it was a glorious empire. Uncomparable military strength. Kind of like us. Architectural design unmatched. A culture like ours. Imagine the riches of the world pouring into the imperial city from most distant places from the east and north and south and west, Rome's might was unquestioned. Her army stood guard in the farthest territories. The Roman government extended the liberty of Rome to the remotest colonies, and yet Rome had everything except God. Thus, it had nothing. It had nothing. Paul comes to Rome to talk about the gospel. I know of no more devastating indictment than the one Paul makes here. He speaks with slashing language of the colossal idolatry that changed the glory of God into images resembling human beings. It's in the 22nd verse. Their foolish hearts were darkened, and professing to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible men. So man's God became man. Man. When worship is corrupted, the human mind becomes distorted, and the emotions follow. When the sense of God is gone, and it goes, all that is worthwhile in society goes with it. And then freed from the restraints of religion, passions rush in. Like a flood, disfigure, scar life. Paul's indictment, they forgot God. And God gave them over to a reprobate mind, is what Scripture says. God said, if that's what you want, that's what you get. You reap what you sow. The virus spreads. And human society becomes infested with those, Paul continues, inventors of evil. Inventors of evil. Covenant breakers, and on and on and on. So Rome falls. So Rome falls. And I submit to you that Paul's words describe America in this day of grace. Once we believe this to be a nation under God, we question that now. I've heard it from you. We question that now. Once there was a unity that prevailed, even in the midst of our individual differences that we had. 
When America's participation in World War I began, one of the best intellectual black American uh, radicals, his mind was immense, W.E.B. Du Bois. He was angry. He was accusing of things that were going on. He indicted America, talked about the problems of America. He had a determinedness about his writing. But when the war started, he stopped and he spoke to both white America and black America. He said, we must close ranks now, America. We must close ranks now. I hope that I'm wrong, but it seems as though many of our national leaders are persons of expediency rather than people of faith. I don't hear a lot of things about faith. And they speak of their vision for America. I think all true vision, all true vision and real dreams come from God. They come from God, not, not political shrewdness. We are not the answer. We need help from the outside. We need help from the outside. The Declaration of Independence starts with these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident. We should know this. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's God who brings nations into being. It's God who continues to hold nations in his hand. And as Paul faces a Rome that looks strong, even though it's decayed from within, he writes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. Paul knew that the gospel of Christ saves us at the crucial points in our lives, those points being first individual and then social. First individual. When God is real to me, when God is real to me, I'm not just a faceless man or woman. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. A child in my father's house. I'm assured that God, my father, knows the way that I take. He walks with me. The very hairs of my head, Scripture says, are numbered strand by strand by strand. I'm aware that God knows my heart, my heart's desires, my sitting down, my rising up. Not even my thoughts are hidden from him. In the presence of the power of Christ and the gospel, Jesus enables me to sing that song. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion? My constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. We do not need to feel ashamed of the gospel of Christ as we face our modern world. Dr. Winfred Neely, who I just found out became the vice president and dean of Moody Bible Institute, is in our church several years ago to speak at our little Bible conference we had. You remember him, powerful speaker in the black tradition. Uh, Debbie Johnson, I mean, she just said this to me today. And uh, we, we both remember this. But he began his sermon with this statement. I've never forgotten it. I have no illusions about my need for Jesus. I have no illusions about my need for Jesus. The gospel has the power to save us from our lost hopes, our dreams. In the words of Dr. King, to make us a blessed community. A blessed community. The question is how? Martin Luther King rightly understanding the human heart asserts that as we relate to each other, even in the midst of deep pain, even in the midst of despair and anger, we need to understand biblical principles 
that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Nothing does more than the gospel. The gospel tells us that we're God's idea. We are God's idea. I will make man in my image. Listen to the psalmist. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When I was being made in secretly, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. And listen to this passage. For God so loved white people. that he gave his only son. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes should not perish but have everlasting. I can fill up the rest of the morning with scriptures. And knowing that we're made in God's image affects not only our understanding of our creator but and our relationship to him. It also sets the stage for understanding and defending the sanctity of human life. How important life is. Every single person, no matter how much the image of God is marred or sinned or, or illness or weak or age, still has the status of being made in the image of God. We're created in the image of God. And that due, is due respect. We are image bearers. We are image bearers. And this informs our conduct with other people. It means that people of every race deserve equal dignity. We don't need importance based on the accumulation of wealth or financial assets. We don't need importance based on the, 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 the type of color of our skin or our work. We do this, or our schooling, we've been to this school, or our political alliance. These are division-creating criteria that are destroying our country. America will endure as we see each other in the image of God, as children of God. The white cop that sits down with a black militant the Puerto Rican, the Hispanic, the Chinese, the European, the African, each one a child of God, made in the likeness of the image of their father. What is more, each of us is counted by Jesus as worthy because he went to the cross for all of mankind. He went to the cross. And we can live together only as we see each other in that image of God, that that person is holy, that person is precious, and we're burdened. Yes, we're burdened. And we have much on our plate. Yet we have amazing potential. This country has amazing potential in this world. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God. This gospel and this gospel alone can save people and save this country. That's my heart. That's my heart. I have no illusions about our need for Jesus. Let me put some biblical legs to this, theological legs, if, if you will, please. Racism is completely antithetical to Christian theology and a Christian understanding of the gospel. The most ultimate, central, most foundational reality that exists is God. God. Before there was a universe, there was God. God is eternal. He's absolute. Everything, everyone is created. Everything comes from that. He created us. Everything else has meaning and worth as it is connected to him. And this absolute, all-sustaining God created everything, including, which we already talked about, human beings, all people created in his image. And the meaning of being created in the image of God is that we have a destiny. a design, a capacity to image God. 
We can image God. We can mirror God. We can reflect God in this world. In Isaiah 43, God says, Bring my sons from afar. Listen to this. My daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone whom I've created for my glory. He designed us so that we would not only find our supreme happiness and worth in him, he designed us for his glory. All people everywhere in every ethnic group on the planet have that as their God-appointed calling and their reason for being, and that's why he set it all up. And the greatest issue in the world, listen to me, the greatest, and I believe this, I, I'm a preacher. I believe this to the depths of my heart. The greatest issue in the world is not, not a single person in this world fulfills that design. Not a single person fulfills his design. L.A., New York, Detroit, Heartland, you know, Minneapolis, Beijing. We've all sinned, Scripture says. We can't one-up anyone. We've all exchanged that glory that we were made for. We're all fallen. We're all bent away from God. And every one of you has done that. Every one of you. Every person on the planet is guilty against treason against God. We've turned everyone to their own way. That's the biggest problem in the world. We have rebelled against the king. We have exposed ourselves. And we deserve God's wrath. And he's angry. And we would be undone eternally if God didn't do something. If God didn't intervene. If God didn't rescue us. And that's exactly what he did. He entered into the middle of history 2,000 years ago in the person of Jesus Christ, fully divine, fully perfectly human, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And he said when he came, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for the many. Surely we find... In scripture, he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. We have streamed him, stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole. And by his stripes we are healed. We have all, like sheep gone astray, turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord God Almighty has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Love came down. Love came down. Love intervened. And by grace you're saved through faith. And what faith means and what I hear when it talks about faith, when I hear the message, I say that's the best news I've ever heard. That's the best news I have ever heard. That's good news. You embrace it. You receive it for the treasure that it is. That's the Christian worldview. And that, my friends, is the gospel. That's the gospel. And that worldview, listen to me, climaxing in the gospel destroys racism. It destroys it. I love this woman. Uh, I, you know, if I had a second mom, i Maybe you've seen her on the news, Avita King, the niece of Dr. Martin Luther. And she rightly says, you know, it's a blood issue. It's a blood issue. We all have the same blood. We all have the same blood. Biblically, there are four truths that destroy racism. First, at creation, we're all created in the image. All of us in his image. Secondly, the sin and the fall. I can't one-up anyone. I'm a miserable sinner. Saved by grace. You are sinful. I am sinful. There's no exalting ourselves above anybody. We're all dead rebels on our way to hell. 
And third, there's that cross. There's always that cross, you know. Jesus died to reconcile us both. Here he's talking about Jews and Gent the rest of the world, the Gentiles. And we say to Jesus in Revelation, the fifth chapter and the ninth verse, listen to these words. You were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people of God, listen, from every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. And you have made them a blessed community. You've made them a kingdom, one kingdom of priests to our God. It's more than a social issue. It's a blood issue. It's a blood issue. Your blood, his blood, you're ransomed. We're different. And fourth is faith. Not a works. And I don't think, it's not just what we do. It's not just works what we do. But I think any distinctive that we think we have, that we're better than anyone. Not about not anything that we have. Not by our uh, who we are, our race. Whatever you think you have. Faith commends you to God. And faith is a desperate cry that says, I can't help myself. I can't help myself. I have no illusion about my need for Jesus. And it removes all ethnic barriers. And it destroys racism. Well, it's a journey, isn't it? I mean, it's a journey, right? We're on a journey. And we are on our way. And it's God's time. A new day is coming. A new day is coming. By the power of God and the triumph of Christ, one day, just like he ended in, 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 in Isaiah, every valley will be exalted. Every mountain will be brought low. There is coming a day by the power of God that the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And as the old spiritual song was sung, there is a bright side somewhere. There's a bright side somewhere. I've got, uh, I don't know how many books by uh, Gardner Taylor. You don't know who he is. I know who he is. He's called the Dean of the Nation's Black Preachers. I read his books for devotionals. They're so powerful. He died on Easter Sunday in 2015 at the age of 96. In one of his sermons, he tells of a colleague of his, Dr. Ray, who was driving through a southern state on a rainy night, and he stopped to get gasoline. He said to the attendant, where am I? What is this place? And the attendant said to him, are you lost? And Dr. Ray said, no, sir. I'm not lost. I'm on the right road. And I'm traveling in the right direction. I don't know where I am right now, but I'm not lost. I don't know what the future holds. But people of God, we're not lost. We're not lost. We know where we are in Christ. We know truth. The hills may get steep. The traveling may seem sometimes long. And we get tired and we get weary. But if you're in Christ Jesus, you're on the right road. You're on the right road. I got a, a clip that they're going to play for. This is from the daughter of Tony Evans that I thought was extremely powerful about her her understanding of who she is. Okay. I do not describe myself as a black woman because that gives too much power to my blackness. I don't want black my race 
to be the describing adjective, the defining adjective of who I am as a woman. I am not a black woman, I am a Christian woman who happens to be black. Because it's the job of your adjective to describe the noun of who you are. And if there's going to be an adjective describing me, it is not going to be my race, it is going to be that I am a woman who believes in every single thing that my word, that my God has declared to be true. And I will stand firmly on the promises of his word because I will be girded in truth. So you may be a black woman, a black man, a white woman, a white man, but that should not define you. So that if your race or if your political group is going in a different direction than the word of God, you don't choose your blackness or your whiteness or whatever culture you are, you do not choose that. Or your political persuasion over what it is that God's word declares to be true. tell you this, but God doesn't ride the backs of donkeys or elephants. He did not come to take sides. He came to take over. I'll give you something to do. Sometimes we feel we can't do anything. I got a, uh, I was sitting with uh, Chris Bargle and uh, an ex-cop and he had great concerns. And he was uh, saying, you know, there's a, a group that started praying now, and they do it every day at 8 o'clock in the evening. 8 o'clock p.m., they pray for the country. They pray for the, the unrest. They pray for people. And I want to invite you to do that as a church. That every day at 8 o'clock, wherever you are, to pause, pray. To pray. If my people, right, right, we know it, will pray. Humble themselves. Not about us. It's about him and his glory. Eight o'clock. Pray. Pray for the country. I'm going to ask those that are in the band to come up. We'll close with a song. Amazing Grace, a great song to, to end on. And I don't know. I'm not going to tell you what to pray for when you pray at eight o'clock. You're bright people. But all areas of concern that deal with our country, we deal with our, our church. All areas. Bring them before the Lord. Let's do this every day. And remember the Lord.